Hello, Alex. Hey, Matt. Good to be with you. Thanks for filling in for uh, Bill Sher, who is on assignment. And I know you've been on Blogging Hits before, but but for those who don't know you, if you would talk a bit about about who you are. Yeah, uh, I'm Alex Seitzwald. I, I uh, just started a new job at MSNBC.com, where I'll be covering Hillary Clinton and the Democratic side of uh, 2016. Came from National Journal before that and uh, Salon before that. Uh, MSNBC.com, really you know, excited to be there, ramping up, hiring a lot of great people uh, with an emphasis on original reporting and you know, being out in the field and kind of taking the, the massive resources that you have with a, the with a cable news network and applying it to you know, on the ground, written reporting, uh, long form feature stories. So it's a really exciting place to be as we're, we're building up. It's still a brand new thing, uh, but great leadership, great editors, and I'm, and I'm thrilled to be there. That is excellent. Um, you know, great to great to talk with you. And uh, let's talk. In, let's talk impeachment, uh, which is something that I think has been a hot story on both sides of the aisle. And um, you know, I guess the 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 question is like, is this a serious story? Is it a bogus story, or is it a serious story because people think it's serious? Where do you come down on this? It's a great question. I mean, I think it's 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 both of those things at once. It, it, I'm having dismissed the Tea Party mm -hmm. in 2009, in like April of 2009, as a, as a silly story. I am loath to dismiss anything uh, as a silly story. You know, th this. Oh, I didn't. I didn't know that you dismissed the Tea Party as a silly story. Oh, uh, privately, you, you've been you've been. I know you've been very prescient about other. Other things. In fact, <laughs> recently was there was just something recently that you had predicted that came true. I yeah, I get I get I get lucky every so often, but uh, you know <laughs> I I get it wrong too. Uh, I mean, yeah, just private. I didn't think it would last. I didn't think it would turn. Into, I don't think anyone thought it would turn into you know what what it what it turned into. Um, but I think this is the impeachment is sort of the logical conclusion of what started with the Tea Party, um, you know, and what started with the, this just like deep. Uh, disenchantment that's that's a light word hatred would be a stronger word or, or loathing of the white house from the, the conservative right i mean people have been talking about this for years so i was waiting i mean i was expecting impeachment to come along sooner we've had sort of flashes of it here and there um but this particular wave of impeachment fever which is definitely the highest it's been is definitely a little silly and that i think it's mostly driven by democrats uh right ascribing pretending to read the minds of Republicans when there aren't, it's really hard to find a Republican who actually publicly says they want to impeach the president, which is, is a kind of funny uh, thing. You've done yeah, that. there are a couple, a couple things that I thought were interesting. One is Nate Silver recently, just minutes ago, put something up about how uh, I think MSNBC has mentioned it five times as much as Fox or something like that. Um, and I do think that, you know, I remember back in the late nineties, when George Stephanopoulos had gone over to the journalism side and he mentioned the word impeachment on air in regards to Bill and Clinton and Monica Lewinsky scandal. And it was a huge deal. It was the I word. Yeah. And it was like, the, I think it was the first time, you know, there was the angle that he had been, worked for Clinton, obviously, but it was also like the first time that someone serious had said the word impeachment. And Bill, the Clintons were apparently very upset and it was a really big deal. And now you have Democrats like wanting to talk about impeachment. It's, it's like the exact opposite of what it was, which I think is quite telling, in fact. Oh, yeah, totally. I mean, it, you know, I, and I've even seen some people look back on the Stephanopoulos incident and, and suggest that it was uh, staged, you know, or that he intentionally raised that for the White House because it, it sort of worked out well in the end for the White House. But that's definitely not the case. I mean, that was I don't think anyone in the White House then was was thinking that impeachment would work out well for them. Uh, now, with the hindsight of that experience, it's a totally different story. You, you had Dan Pfeiffer, uh, senior advisor at the White House, openly talking about it. Uh, you've had lots of I, I just this this week. I've had lunch with two Democratic sources who are almost like chomping at the bit. You know, they want they want this to go ahead. The uh, the D Triple C has been fundraising office. They had their best fundraising day of this cycle. Uh, on the, the impeachment, uh, you know, bonanza. And, uh, and you have John Boehner calling it a democratic scam. Uh, 
But, you know, of course, there are some that Steve Scalise, the, the one thing that everybody points to is Steve Scalise, the, the new number three in the House, you know, after Eric Cantor is gone, he's moved up in the role. He pointedly refused to rule out impeachment uh, on the Sunday shows because his base, you know, there are there is a lot of movement in the base. You mentioned MSNBC and Fox, but I, I think if you look at uh, talk radio, which is arguably more influential or, or is at least very influential in the conservative movement, you know, Limbaugh, Hannity, uh, Levin, those guys, I don't know about Hannity actually, but Limbaugh and, and Levin have definitely been talking of impeachment lately and, and you know, kind of pushing Boehner from the right to, to move ahead with it. So it's it's out there, but yeah. no. There, there's a book out by a National Review writer making the case for impeachment. Sarah Palin, obviously, most famously called for impeachment. So, I mean, it's, you know, un, I think it's unfortunate for Republicans, but even though Democrats benefit from this, you you know, there are there are enough conservatives and Republicans out there who have sort of talked about it that you can't completely distance yourself from it. Right. Right. So it, it is, yeah, it is, it is interesting. I also, another phenomenon that you, I think, alluded to there is, you know, how things change and how we're kind of always fighting the last war. I mean, you know, I think Stephanopoulos was trying to establish himself as a mainstream journalist yeah. by sort of separating himself from his old boss. Um, but the worry back then was, if you thought of impeachment, you thought of Richard Nixon. And I'm old enough to remember, you know, uh, there, was even a, there was even a joke. I mean, this was in pop culture. There, the t this old TV show called Alice. Uh, and and there, there was this scene where Tommy, the little boy, uh, Alice's son, uh, recites all the presidents up, up to that point. And at the end, the mom says, that's very good, but you forgot Nixon. And the kid says, we're all trying to forget Nixon. <laughs> um, <laughs> Nixon, like, was a laughingstock. Uh, and, and, and I think that there was a sense that if you impeach somebody, and of course, Nixon resigned before they impeached him, but there was a sense that if you impeach somebody, you were destroying their legacy forever. Yeah. That, that, that you would turn, that, that if, if Bill Clinton were impeached, he would become Nixon. And not just for a moment, but that his entire, you know, his entire like tenure would be marred and tainted by this. And Clinton proved that that wasn't the case. And so now I think people, it's easier to laugh about the impeachment thing than it was, you know, at, you know, 15 years ago. Absolutely. And it only happened once in the entire history of the country uh, before that. But, you know, I think I, a lot of the attacks on Obama seem that at least my liberal friends like to say they're unprecedented. It's really not true. It was a lot of similar things were said about Clinton. So I think that's why, you know, some of the, the, the strategist level Democrats, the senior Democrats who see the, the political potential here, they're seeing this as the culmination of the same attacks that they use against Clinton that they're using against Obama. And it just sort of seems like it's a natural, logical conclusion. Uh, but there's a funny thing. I was, I was talking with a friend about this. And you could go through and almost everybody in Washington, if you really want to be kind of cynical and nihilistic about it, almost every in Washington benefits from impeachment. I mean, the you know Democrats clearly the, from fundraising politically uh, they do. It. I think that a lot of people in the conservative base want it. The media would it's a great story. You know, Congress isn't really doing much of anything else right now. 2016 is a is a ways away. Uh, the liberal media would love it because it would make conservatives look crazy. Conservative media would like it because it's a great story. And you know, even most House Republicans would do great because they're in safe districts. They don't have to worry about it. Uh, it's like John Boehner, the GOP leadership, and a handful of Republicans in swing districts that are the real victims, and otherwise everybody wins. You know, that's for, a great. No, that's a great point. It is. There are all sorts of uh, moral hazards and and bad incentives there. But you're totally right. Oh yeah, I mean the other victim is American democracy. But but yes. aside from that, you know. yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. And we're you know the the culture and and. Yeah, um, but otherwise, it's in it's in everybody's interest, self interest, to sort of push it along. Absolutely. Yeah, and and you could even you know make an argument that it, you know, it would probably hurt if it happened before the the midterms, which I don't think is even you know feasible. But say it were to, and it and it stopped the Senate Republicans from gaining uh, a majority, you could make an argument that an individual Republican senator is better off being in the minority than having a very narrow majority. And having Ted Cruz breathing down your neck constantly with 
you know, high expectations of what you're oh, going yeah. to do. No, I think that's a calculation that, that like the chamber of commerce and the NRSC have made that, you know, that, that they would rather like, for example, if, if the choice is to have, you know, Chris McDaniel and Ted Cruz and Milton Wolf and a slim majority, they may be better off not, not doing that. I mean, under which scenario are you more likely to get primary? You know, de- definitely in the majority scenario, when you when you inevitably fail to live up to the expectations of the the base. You know, the, whereas if you're in the minority, it's you know, you, you, it's the expectations are obviously much lower. I want to say something about impeachment because um, I think there are a couple interesting things about it too. One is the thing I don't like about it, and by, and as you know, this is sort of a phenomenon that is, you know, there have always been people calling for impeachment, but now it's essentially the case that whoever the president is, there will be calls for impeachment. Mm. I mean, there was a Democrat congressman from, from Texas who, who wanted to impeach Reagan on two different occasions. There were calls to impeach Bush, the George H.W. Bush. Clinton was impeached. And there's almost a sense that if you can't win at the ballot box, you can reverse the will of the people by virtue of impeachment. And, yeah. and, and I think that's nullification and is, and is, is kind of dangerous uh, and it's sort of a bad precedent, a, a spoiled loser thing to precedent to set. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, I, you can look at Wisconsin as an example. You know, Scott Walker was hardly a popular guy, but he was reelected I think in large measure, and you can look at, there's a lot of polling data to support this, because people just didn't think it was the, a, a fair process to, to do a recall. And I think impeachment is sort of the same, uh, you know, idea. It's just, that's just not how the system should work. And people don't like that. Exactly. Yeah. It's a sort of a sore loser thing. So yeah. Um, now, you know what, though, in the case of Scott Walker, um, it may end up working for the left, though, because... Although Walker survived it, and I think he got, there was a backlash against the, the, the attempt to recall him, and he benefited from that. He now will be facing, you know, this is like his third straight election in, you know, a few years, and they've all been very tough and close, and, and he's running against Mary Burke, and the last I checked, that's a very close race. You have to wonder what the, you know, accumulated, uh, difficulties, you know, that, that Walker is faced by virtue of having to fend off. And that's the other issue, I think, is the difficulty. Yeah, I'm not one of these people that believes that it's impossible to be a great modern president. I, I think it's possible. Mm. But I also think that it's harder than it was. And and that, that you know, look, when Nixon was impeached, Republicans, a lot of Republicans voted, you know, to impeach him. And, and a lot of Republicans were... were in fact, I think it was a Republican uh, who said, you know, what does the president know and when did he know it? You know, mm-hmm. uh, Republicans were a part of that. And there was a sense in the whole country, you know, once it became clear Nixon's level of involvement. And, and I should point out, you know, Obama's had a lot of bad things that have happened, but there's no smoking gun showing that he ordered, you know, Lois Lerner to investigate conservatives. If, if that if that email or something comes out, then then we have a different story. But yeah. but one gets the sense that what happens now is if the Republicans in office, Democrats want to impeach him. Or some Democrats. If a Democrat's in office, some Republicans want to impeach him. And so Republicans could impeach Obama, and it would be meaningless because it would be seen as as solely a partisan exercise. And I think the problem collectively there is when Nixon was impeached, it meant something because it sent a signal to presidents that if you overstep your bounds, Republicans and Democrats are going to come together and hold you accountable. Now, by virtue of this reflexive instinct of whatever sides out of power trying to impeach the president, it almost makes impeachment meaningless. Yeah, which is bad news, right? Yeah, I think that's a great that's a great point. Uh, I mean, it's it's so hard to tell, you know, if there is even a line anymore uh, that. You know, is there anything that Obama could do that would get his his staunchest allies in Congress to you know go to to turn on him or to vote for impeachment? I don't know. Is was there anything that Bush could have done? 
and and without that you know if everyone is just going to stick to their their partisanship above all else that that's that is a really uh you know it's another of course it's a big trend it shows itself in everything but you know that's a that's a really kind of scary precedent to set uh because yeah because it, because you you want this sort of damocles hanging over the president's head saying don't go too far because it could all come crashing down but if impeachment doesn't mean anything, if it, if it just means you were a good Republican or a good Democrat, then that removes a barrier that might prevent bad activity. Like Nixon, like, like, like actually bad activity. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I mean, we, you know, and I think a lot of liberals, a lot of Democrats, a lot of younger uh, liberals look back on impeachment and uh, Clinton impeachment. I think it was a joke. They think he was impeached for uh, a sexual act that I'm not sure if I can say the name of on Blogging Hits TV. <laughs> But, you know, it was it was it wasn't because of that. It was because he perjured himself under oath, which is a crime. You know, I, I, I still think it was impeachment was totally, uh, un, you know, overbroad punishment. To, it didn't fit the crime. But there was an actual underlying crime there. But it's been in our you know revisionist history. It's been remembered as such a purely partisan thing that it's that it's lost any kind of edge, uh, you know, whatsoever. Right. And then the other thing that happens is that people assume People conflate impeachment with removal from office. Right. And of course, that would take, I think, a two thirds Senate vote and that would never happen. Um, and you see, though, you, you see it's funny. I, I've, you're seeing Republicans like um, Tom Cotton and some others who are saying, you know, the reason they're against impeachment <laughs> is because, well, Joe Biden would just become president. So what good would it you know, what good would it do? So. It's fi- they're finding ways to nuance uh, opposition to impeachment. Yeah, well, and I th- part of that I think is you know if you're a Republican member of Congress, you've got a right flank, just like Democrats did under Bush. You know there are plenty of liberals, liberal base that wanted Bush impeached. I, I remember having conversations in college, but oh, but if you impeach Bush, then you get Dick Cheney. Ah, you know like, <laughs> that's no better. So I it, I think it's it's a way to. Uh, you know, to try to diffuse the tension because it, it, the Boehner and like the, you know, the, the guys who, who think on his level know that it would be, you know, political suicide. So they, they have to find some way to kind of diffuse that tension. And I think the lawsuit, uh, you know, suing the president over the executive action, I think that's part of the, the reason to do it. And he even used the I word when he talked about the lawsuit. So it's, it's like, you know, well, we can't impeach him, but we're doing this. So, so hopefully that will, you know, Tied them over at least in the meantime, which has been the way sort of <laughs> Boehner's handled the uh, you know that that wing of his caucus all along. I know I can't tell if Boehner is this brilliant 21st century Machiavellian figure or a complete patsy. It's, un- <laughs> it's unclear to me. Just but, uh, just the fact that you, that those two things could both be true, and it's hard to tell which is is <laughs> is, is, is amazing. You know, <laughs> it is. He could be. He could be either. All right. Well, so you mentioned you're you're covering the uh, the, the Democratic side um, for MSNBC.com, and I know you're working on something on Hillary Clinton and uh, her interesting efforts to distance herself a little bit from the Obama administration, uh, which is always a a challenge for someone trying to su- succeed a president. Um, of their party is how do you become your own person and uh, without it looking like you are throwing them under the bus. And in that regard, how, how is she doing? Yeah, it's, it's I mean, you almost have to treat Hillary Clinton as an incumbent uh, heading into to 2016. And part of that means that she has this weight of the, the current White House, which is not very popular, as we know, um, hanging over her. And so she's been very, very careful to, to put no daylight between herself and the president. Before her book tour came out, there were even strategy sessions with the White House where they, the message that they settled on, which she includes in her book, it was actually a letter that Obama wrote to one of her top aides, and then Hillary included in her book, is that we, we were a team of rivals that became an unrivaled team. So that's, always, that's been sort of their, their grand narrative about you know, the Obama-Clinton relationship. Uh, and she's policy wise, she's stuck right on the White House line until this week. And it's small, but very noticeable because of, you know, when you know that context on the border crisis, uh, the, you know, the, the base, the Democratic base, very unhappy with the way that 
you know, Washington is handling it. They want uh, an expansion of the deferred action policy that would let more people stay here legally, uh, you know, these, these kids. And there's this 2008 law that's gotten a lot of attention. Conservatives want to change or repeal. It was signed by Bush, but it basically makes it very hard to deport uh, minors who, who might be refugees and you have to care for them in certain ways. So it, it's almost impossible to deal with this crisis with that law in any kind of you know, short time frame. At first, she said she would be open to uh, reworking the law, which is exactly the White House position you know, that they're studying it. But then this week in an interview with George Ramos uh, on Fusion, which is, you know, he's a, it's a Spanish language, uh, well, the, the network is, is not Spanish language, but it's, it's reaching a Hispanic audience, which I think is interesting. She said she didn't want to repeal the law and that she wants to preserve it. So she's taking a position to the left of the White House. This is the first major policy item where you can find her doing that. And it also comes after Martin O'Malley, the, the governor of Maryland, who's also eyeing a presidential bid, took a much stronger position to the left of the president. So, you know, it, it's kind of a, a small thing. But it, is, it, is, it is funny that, that the, the move to the left entails supporting a George W. Bush law. <laughs> 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 yeah, right. That shows you how far we've uh, we've come, especially on immigration. I mean, you know, of course, uh, if I think you could compare the Bush immigration proposals to the Obamas or the Senate, the, the current Senate, and you you find that there's a lot of you know similarity there. Um, but yeah, I mean, this, this, it, it, there will be a lot more of this coming, and it's just interesting to watch her, you know, kind of take these these faulting steps, and and uh, you know, it, it's not. I don't, I don't think this is a, it's somewhat calculated, but it's, she doesn't have a, a big political team. She doesn't have a polling apparatus. She doesn't have focus group. So this is clearly filtering up through sort of informal channels to her. And she's realizing that she has to take, uh, you know, a more liberal position in the White House here. Yeah, I have to say, I'm not sure what it is about her. I mean, there, there are politicians, for example, who can, you know, parry a question, change the subject, and you don't notice they're doing it. And then there are politicians who like completely telegraph. I think Romney even said, I'm not going to answer that question. Let me answer the question I want to answer or something. Like yeah, that. right. Yeah. It's not how you do it. Um, and there are certainly politicians who can can change, evolve, change positions and, and do it kind of seamlessly. Like I suspect Bill Clinton could sort of do that. Mm -hmm. I get the sense when Hillary does this that it, it looks very um, – very strategic, and um, I think it may play into the whole calculating, the image of her being like very calculating, and the way that she voted for the Iraq war, you know, assuming that that was a smart political move. Again, we're always fighting the last war. You know, we talked about this with impeachment. Yeah. It, you know, Democrats had always lost or had lost frequently because they were seen as insufficiently tough on foreign policy, national security. So she calculates that she needs to, you know, maybe being a woman, be the iron woman, uh, and that would help her. And of course, ironically, that is arguably the reason she loses to Obama. Right. And so is it just me or, or isn't there a danger when she, as she creates this daylight, that it also looks, you know, uber political? I, I think there absolutely is. I mean, that's a danger in everything she does. Part of it is fair. You know, they, they are, uh, she does have a, a reputation, rightly so, of, you know, being very careful about positions she takes, just like any politician. But she's at such a level, she's so risk averse, she has such an apparatus around her that there, you know, there are more kinds of uh, checks and balances that go into every decision she makes. Part of it is unfair, too. I mean, the media, you know, people like me, are, she's getting so much attention right now that every breath she takes is parsed. You know, every t stop on her book tour is inferred for meaning, uh, and and part of that is probably just unfair. I mean, you know, there there there's only so much you can control uh, as a politician. But yeah, I mean, you know, it, it, just as it appeared calculating that she stuck very close to the White House when we know there were disagreements internally on you know key issues. Uh, when she starts to move away from the White House, it's going to look unfair too. The Clinton defenders pull their hair out about this because, you know, that could be her genuine position and they could be saying, look, we're responding to your criticism. She's telling you what she genuinely feels and you're calling her, you know, calculated and you're saying she's just doing it for politics. 
Uh, and I, and that's going to be one of the big challenges of her campaign is overcoming that perception that she's, you know, in part set by her, set herself and the team around her in 2008, where she intentionally, very, very intentionally did not show, you know, humanity or emotion or they, they, were, they were trying to combat notions that, you know, a woman couldn't be president. Uh, and so in the end, once she started losing and that playbook went out the window and she was, you know, taking shots and going bowling, she became this much more approachable human candidate. Uh, but the question is when she's winning, can she still present that? I, I, a Clinton insider you know, told me recently that the, the Clintons are at their best when they're, they're backs against the wall, they're losing, they're fighting up a battle. And they're at their worst when they're on top and they're winning because they you know, just clamp up and, and don't, they can't make the tough decisions, the hard choices, if you will, uh, to do what they need to do. And that's exactly the position that Hillary finds herself in now. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Absolutely. There's something about a comeback and about, you know, uh, and, and I agree. I think Hillary became much more a, an attractive candidate once she started, you know, once she was the, the underdog. Um, there's also an issue with Iran that, that you mentioned uh, offline. But what, what's the daylight there? Yeah. So, you know, you were saying that, that on foreign policy. She's she's always been hawkish, more hawkish than Obama. That was, of course, was the uh, you know 2008 the, the Iraq War issue, um, and uh, but then she was the Secretary of State, and so particularly on foreign policy, it's difficult for her to show daylight. So she's she this week in an interview uh, with Fareed Zakari on CNN, she was asked about Iran, and she negotiated the deal with Iran, which includes low level of a you know, civilian enrichment for power, but not for nuclear uh, weapons, uh, which, so it allows some enrichment. But she said in this interview that any enrichment of uranium at all could lead to an arms race in the Middle East, uh, you know, could tip off the whole thing. Again, it's, it's a small thing, but it's, it's, a, it's rhetorically to the right of uh, where the Obama administration is. And you get people like the nation a uh, magazine wrote a big thing, you know, the headline, like, has Hillary Clinton thrown herself in with the neocons over this comment? And so it's a, it's a bit of, you know, classic Clintonian triangulation. On immigration, she puts herself slightly to the left of the White House. On uh, Iran and national security, she puts herself slightly to the right of the White House, and especially in the context of the, you know, war in Gaza, uh, when Iran and Israel, that, that relationship is, is front and center. She's kind of, you know, signaling to those people that she's still with them. You know, there was a poll, I think Dave Weigel wrote about this. Uh, I think it was, maybe it was a CNN poll, I forget. But there was a poll that showed that Romney would beat Obama today, but but Hillary would clobber Romney. And the interesting thing that Weigel points out is that Hillary was winning the white vote or, mm -hmm. or, or doing much better. Maybe it wasn't winning the white vote, but doing much better than any Democrat in decades with the white vote. And I think that's a really interesting thing that I do believe that there are that there are um, a lot of folks who didn't support Obama who might support Hillary and the baggage, the the sort of you know, she's been around so long. I think there's some nostalgia for the 90s and for the Clinton years, even amongst people who opposed them at the time. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know if you're picking up on that or not, but I, that struck me as, as uh, you know, I, I'm from a. Um, Western Maryland, and uh, some of the folks out there where I'm from, a really rural area, are are kind of like um, Mike Huckabee populists. You know, it's they love their God and guns, but they also like the government <laughs> helping them. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, maybe they don't anymore in the wake of the Tea Party thing. But when I was coming up, there was, it was a sort of that populist thing. Yeah, and I could see a lot of them now, sort of liking Hillary, especially if, you know, depending on who, who runs against her. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, and, and Clinton's people are very happy to have this conversation. You know, when, when um, Rand Paul brought up Monica Lewinsky a few months back, I was talking to one of them and they said, you know, if, if, if he wants to bring up the 90s, we're happy to talk about 23 million jobs created, lowest unemployment, uh, you know, the, the country doing better than it has done in you know, almost a a century or since the World War II. So I, I think that's absolutely right. And you've seen uh, Hillary, when she talks about her kind of economic vision, she often does this kind of nod and a wink where she doesn't talk about the, the Obama uh, 
economic policy, even though she was in the Obama administration, she goes all the way back to the Clinton policy, which of course, you know, saw this huge growth and was, uh, she can also has a, has a reasonable claim to being her husband. So I think that's, that's absolutely something that, that she can tap into and that they expect to tap into. And there's just a lot of people, you know, in, in hindsight, we always remember things better than, than they actually were. Uh, like we were talking yeah. about impeachment, people forget about the impeachment. They just remember, oh, Bill, he's like a fun, you know, he's Bubba. Look, even I'm guilty of this. Yeah. I mean, of all people, I mean, you know, I hated Bill Clinton uh, at the time, but the 90s were pretty amazing. And looking back on it, it I mean, look, you could, I mean, you certainly you could argue Clinton let bin Laden slip away and we, you know, the party of the 1990s, we woke up with a hangover. I mean, I, I get that. But just look, most people aren't going to think through that much. They're right. just going to reflexively, the 90s were a pretty damn good time as far as I'm concerned. I mean, I, and I had a lot of fun in the 1990s <laughs> and like, we won't even go into it all here, but yeah, right. uh, if she's selling that, then I'm buying, you know what I mean? Yeah. A, she should own it. Absolutely. And and I think she and I think she will. I mean, there's there's baggage there, but there's I think most of the baggage over time, the baggage has faded in importance and relevance and the good times are are better remembered. And, you know, the, the classic political adage when you're explaining you're losing. So if you have to go, if the counter to that is, well, it was a, you know, a, a, a bubble caused by low interest rates, whatever, you're 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 already losing. You know, like that's, yeah, that's not going to. Yeah. And you could argue that, I mean, you know, again, you could certainly argue that like we're peeling glass Steagall, so sure. the seeds I and mean, there were a lot of, you know, but that that's hard to explain. It's easier to explain. I remember the 90s and, and it was a time of peace and prosperity. So yeah. own and, it. Own it. Exactly. And, and I think with with Hillary in general and the Clintons, you get a, a lot of people, you know, if we had a kind of uh, Australian voting system or, or, a, or a ranked choice system. She might not be the first choice of a lot of people, but she'll easily be a second or third choice because you sort of know what you're getting. You know, you yeah. might you might not be overly thrilled with her. Like a lot of liberals might want Elizabeth Warren. But yeah, you know, Hillary Clinton, she's she's fine. Obviously, there's going to be a core contingent of people who will hate her no matter what. That's and that's that's inevitable. But I think a lot of independents and even some, you know, moderate Republicans, if, if Rand Paul becomes the nominee, which I don't think is going to happen, but, you know, for it's possible. It's not outside their own possibility. Somebody who's you know pro-Israel, who who wants a strong defense. I could I could almost see them going to to vote for her because it's it's a sort of known commodity. Yeah, and let's give some props to uh, the DMZ, Bill Share, and yours truly, who were out in front of this years ago, predicting that that it's possible the neocons could line up behind Hillary mm. if. Uh, if if Rand Paul got the nomination, and we've seen in recent weeks and months other people making that speculation, folks, you heard it here first. Let's turn to uh, if if the Clintons are a soap opera, then <laughs> then this I think this I don't think cameras are allowed in the courtroom, which is unfortunate because this could be the O.J. Simpson trial. This could be what cable news needs is the Bob McDonald trial. Yes. Which, the you know, yesterday was the first day of this. And we had um, we had the uh, reports that the, the former first lady of Virginia had a crush on uh, this, this fella who was uh, selling that word vitamin supplements or whatever uh, that had given gifts and appropriately given gifts allegedly to the governor ostensibly to curry favor, but I guess now she's saying that it was because she had a crush on him. You also had the daughter of the governor crying on, you know, sort of, uh, you know, during her testimonial crying about how her wedding was now ruined because uh, the, the $15,000 that was given uh, by this gentleman. So um, are you guys over there, uh, are you fully, ca you know, capitalizing on this story? I think this could be the, the summer... Never mind what's happening in Gaza. Never mind what's happening with <laughs> ISIS. This is TV gold, in my opinion. Yeah, it really is. I mean, it's, you know, the OJ trial was in LA. So maybe the judges there, they have a, you know, an innate sort of appreciation of, of television and of spectacle. And so they allow- Judge Ito. The, yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh man, that's a, that's a throwback. Uh, 
the, yeah, they, you know, they, they understood it. I, I, I wish there were cameras allowed in the, uh, in the courtroom for this thing because it is, I mean, it started out, we knew it was going to be just absolutely Shakespearean or soap opera ish to begin with. I mean, yeah, this guy, Johnny Williams, giving just, just the most like basic kind of corruption you can possibly imagine, giving, you know, Ferrari rides and rides on his private jet and gold watches with the, the governor's name on it. Just, just ridiculous stuff. And then it comes out on the very first day. We get this bombshell from the defense that, you know, McDonald's wife was actually secretly in love with this this guy, Johnny Williams, the, the funder. I mean, it just gets more and more. Uh, yeah. And, and the daughter is involved. It's, it's absolutely unbelievable. And this was a guy, you know, who a lot of people were talking about as a potential front running presidential candidate. He was the chairman of the, the RGA. It's, it's just uh, incredible, you know, how, how far they've fallen. No, Bob McDonald was incredibly popular in Virginia, um, governed as sort of a centrist Republican, you know, in the short list, supposedly for, in fact, Mitt Romney and Ann Romney were apparently interviewed by the prosecution uh, when they're building this case. Um, I think Bob McDonald, I think today is supposed to take the stand. Uh, I haven't heard about how that went. So this thing is, is fascinating. But I think there's an inter the interesting question is, like, okay, on one hand, it's possible that is it Johnny Williams? Is that the guy? Johnny name? Williams, yeah. On one hand, it's possible that Johnny Williams gave these gifts um, as sort of a quid pro quo because he had a business in Virginia and he wanted, you know, regulations to be changed or whatever, um, and that there was a quid pro quo and that this is a bogus story that 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 the first lady is. Uh, sort of falling on the sword a little bit and, and saying my husband had nothing to do with it because I was cheating on him or because I was in love with this other guy. And if that's the case, we don't know, but if that's the case, then you have to wonder if I'm Bob McDonald, would I rather go to jail than have it publicly be known that my wife was stepping out on me? Like, I'm not sure what, I'm not sure which is, which is the worst punishment here. Seriously, I mean, yeah, there's no, no one looks good. You know, the, Johnny Williams is now, he's turned state's evidence and he's the, 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 the star witness here. And, and he's sort of claiming that, you know, they, Bob McDonald and his wife knew exactly what was going on the whole time. It was this, this quid pro quo thing. The Bob McDonald's defense is saying they were, they were kind of duped, you know, that, that Williams, they called him a master manipulator and that, you know, they didn't know. Oh, shucks, we just thought he was being nice to us. We had no idea he wanted anything in return. Meanwhile, Maureen McDonald is saying that, that she was you know, in love with him. All of these scenarios are terrible. Right. <laughs> and Johnny Williams, by the way, you know, the reason he's turned state's evidence or whatever, they uh, exonerated him from another uh, alleged crime uh, in order to get him, I guess, to cooperate in the prosecution. But there are other sort of angles here too, right? You had Ken Cuccinelli, who very narrowly lost a race to, uh, uh, what's his name? Terry McAuliffe. Terry McAuliffe, yeah. Who, who, you know, Cuccinelli was not part of the Bob McDonald cool kids club. You know, he was much more of a, of a, a right wing bomb thrower and, and Bob McDonald was more of an establishment guy. But Cuccinelli had accepted some small gift. I, it didn't strike me as, you know, egregious. So he couldn't separate. He couldn't get the benefit of a popular governor, Bob McDonald, supporting him because Bob McDonald was, you know, uh, a little bit messy at that point. And Cuccinelli couldn't fully separate from the scandal because he was slightly involved. So there were political ramifications and implications to this. The other thing that I found interesting is the reason this story came out to begin with is that the chef, that uh, the chef who worked for the McDonald's had been let go, fired, he says, because the McDonald kids were taking, stealing things from the kitchen, and he got blamed for it. So they let him go. And that's the other thing is you got to tip your waiters and bartenders, people, if you want to, if you want, unless you want them to start talking, you know, telling stories about you, because this guy was pissed off that, that he got fired. And then he goes and, and you know, starts, you know, telling, uh, telling the secrets, airing the dirty laundry. Yeah, I mean, Mitt, Mitt Romney could tell you that too, uh, you know, for the, the caterer who filmed that 47% <laughs> tape. It's, the, it's justice for the, the little guy, you know, the service. Well, but, but in the Romney case, I think that guy had an ideological, you know, axe to grind. I don't think Fair. it was just, I don't think it was that he didn't tip him. But by the way, 
do tip your your waiters and bar <laughs> solve a lot of these problems. That's a that's a fair point. It's a fair point. Uh, but but yeah, absolutely. And and one you know the to to make a kind of policy, try to find a policy argument uh, or out of this crazy you know soap opera is that Virginia doesn't have or, or didn't have uh, really any kind of anti-corruption laws or, or donation laws, good government laws like you find in on the federal level or in most other states. And for a long time, it actually worked out pretty well, or at least if there was anything going on, it was far enough you know, hidden that it didn't come to light. And then this thing just comes along and makes a complete mockery of it. So you're going to see, there, there's already been, you know, they passed some smaller things, but you'll see probably some bigger moves there. Uh, and in an age when, you know, the Supreme Court says you can have a super PAC where somebody like Johnny Williams, for instance, can give, you know, millions of dollars and there's no corruption as long as there's no coordination. I think that this, just even though it's very low sophisticated, uh, you know, corruption, I think this just goes to show that there, it's probably better to have those laws in place than to not have them in place. Yeah, really interesting story. Um, and, you know, it's got all the elements, you know, there, there's sex, there's you know, there's crime, there's politicians. I mean, Bob McDonald is a, and a very is sort of attractive candidate. Um, looks the part of a president, even um, who who was brought down by this scandal. Um, you know, so just you know, it, it's a great story, and I would not be surprised if this becomes a much bigger story uh, because I just feel like it has all the elements that would be play great on TV. And of course, you know, the, the sort of uh, paranoid side of me says that, you know, the mainstream media would love nothing more than to have a Republican to kick around a little bit. And he's certainly a great foil for that. Yeah. I, and, and, you know, the, the, he was, you mentioned Cuccinelli, uh, apparently Mitt Romney also took a ride on this guy's Johnny Williams's jet. You know, there you could you could you could find enough there to try to turn it into something. Although I don't think there's any evidence really to support uh, much beyond what's going on in court right now. But uh, yeah, I mean, it it does fit into some kind of established yeah. liberal narratives about corruption and uh, yeah, know, big, big and I, donors when they're politicians in their pockets, etc. Yeah, and I think there's a lot of other things like the whole. You know, I, I don't want to be accused of the whole like Lady Macbeth thing here, but you know, you marry the wrong person. You know, there's a sense that maybe Bob McDonald. Uh, I think was she a Redskins cheerleader? I'm not sure, but uh, you know, I'll probably get beat up beat up for this. But you know, I mean, you know, I think that maybe is a lesson. Uh, the other thing that I actually wrote about at the week, you know, months ago, when maybe even a year ago, when the story kind of broke, was the the danger of having a powerful position but not having money. You know, mm. you, you're governor of Virginia, you're making, I don't know, like a hundred thousand dollars a year and you're hanging out with millionaires. And is that, you know, do, does that create a, a certain, uh, uh, you know, disparity that, that, that might, uh, you know, be difficult, you know, I, you know, that's, that doesn't excuse by any means, um, bribery or, or accepting gifts, quid pro quo, but it might help explain the challenges of people who are sort of thrust into a, a higher social class, um, but don't have the wherewithal to kind of support it independently. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point. I mean, and it's obviously we want to have elected officials from all different classes. So I don't think the you know, solution is to not have. Yeah, <laughs> uh, right. But, but but I that's why I've always been really skeptical of these kind of populist calls to, you know, reduce the pay of legislators um, and especially their staffers. I think, you know, if, if you're a congressman or a governor or a senator, that's a really important job and you should be paid commensurate to that. It should, you know, there should be, I believe in, you know, market uh, incentives. And I think there should be a, a financial incentive in addition to a public service incentive to, you know, to, to hold this job, if for nothing else, then it, then it stops corruption because, you know, maybe if he could afford to rent a Ferrari, he wouldn't have to take Johnny Williams uh, you know, Ferrari out for a spin or, or if he could get a taste of it. Obviously there are, you know, very personal, deeper things here that, that he was sort of almost, it, it looks like they have this kind of enchantment with, with wealth that, you know, goes beyond uh, anything yeah. excusable. 
But yeah, I, I you know pay pay public officials more. I, I know that's an unpopular position, but it might help avoid some of these kinds of scenarios. All right. Well, we'll end on an area of agreement. We both hold this unpopular opinion. I think you're right. Um, thank you for doing it. Let's plug uh, plug something. How can people keep up with you and and your writing? Yeah, they can uh, check me out at msnbc.com or on Twitter at a sightswald. Awesome. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And I think we had a great conversation. Thanks so much, Matt. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. All right. Have a good one. You too.